Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our town hall for charitable organizations. Today's topic is professional solicitors and uh, fundraising council registration requirements. Thrilled you joined us this morning. Uh, my name is Michael Schlein. I'm the division administrator for the Charities and Legal Services Division of the Secretary of State's office. So uh, uh, please know the platform restricts attendance, not the Secretary of State indicated in the email notification about today's town hall. It will be recorded. A link to the recording will be made available on the Secretary of State's website underneath the Charities tab. And by choosing to join the town hall today, you are consenting to the recording uh, as a part of participating in this town hall. The recording and presentation is provided for informational purposes only. Uh, the information is not intended to be legal advice. Uh, we'll reserve some time at the end for questions, and, and you may find that some of your questions are answered as the presentation progresses. You're also welcome to place questions in the chat box. Uh, prevent confusion about the source of information. Please don't answer those questions in the chat box. Place the questions in there. Our staff uh, will respond to the questions, uh, or they may choose to announce it at the end uh for just the general question and answer portion we'll do our best to answer all those questions and of course questions are invited during the q a session at the end so uh without further ado uh, let's get started thanks again everybody uh so we're going to talk a lot about professional solicitors, fundraising councils and their registration requirements you remember earlier this year some of you may have attended the town hall where we talk about charitable registration requirements and that town hall is recorded and it is on the charity page of the secretary of state's website so if you're looking for charity registration and you're with a charity you may also want to view that town hall uh so that goes over that information so first things first uh secretary of state's office overseeing charitable organizations and professional solicitors fundraising councils the law is in the uh, is the Maryland Solicitations Act. It's in the Business Regulation Article, Title VI of the Annotated Code of Maryland, and you can also find uh, regulations in the Code of Maryland Regulations, uh, Title I, Subtitle II, Chapters Four and Five, and you can actually purchase a hard copy of the handbook uh, from this link on our website. And we update that handbook as as any laws change. So uh, first thing before we get started with all the requirements for professional solicitors and fundraising councils, online registrations as of January 1st, 2023. For those that don't know, we uh, went with a online registration system called One Stop or worked through One Stop. Uh, went live on August 15th, 2022. Uh, a couple important notes though, if you've already submitted a paper application, don't submit another one online. We will process that paper application. Communications, including renewal reminders and compliance letters are now going to be sent through the new registration system via email. So you're going to get, you know, whereas, uh, you know, several years ago, you'd get registration letters mailed to you. Uh, then during COVID times, things were getting emailed to you. Now that registration letter is going to come by way of email or compliance letter, depending on what it is we're filing. If your organization's already registered, do not submit a new application, create a one-stop account, claim your record to file your renewal applications. Uh, it's important, right? We don't want multiple registrations for one charity. We want a one single uniform file so that everybody's on the same page and we're up to date we're not asking you for stuff you've already sent us and uh maybe mislabeling somebody as current or not current uh, that, that should be current so uh no filing if you've already registered with the or agency even if by paper not in one stop don't file a new registration in the online system create your one stop account claim your record there's a lot of information on how to do that there's a user guide and there's also a video that shows you how to create a one-stop account and claim your record in the one-stop system and then there's also user guides for filing annual registration whether it's charities or the paid fundraisers 
if the organization owes part of an annual registration from a prior year, we may request it to, uh, to be sent to us outside of the online system. Uh, usually we're doing that to avoid situations where it might cause double payment where maybe you've sent the check and then you're going to go file online. It's going to ask you to pay uh, because you sent the check. It doesn't know that you paid yet uh, for that particular online filing. A couple more notes about one stop, uh, accessing one stop. Uh, the account, uh, it's going to need to be created using the email address that we have on record for the organization. Uh, what is that email address? It's whatever email address provided by the organization on its last registration. So charities, solicitors, fundraising councils, public safety solicitors have all been asked to provide emails as part of their annual registrations for several years now. That email address, uh, and we'll, you know, we're specific in, in the way we ask in our direct in our instructions to on the form, give us the email address that you're going to should be used for the purpose of charitable registration. So that's the email address that's logged into the system. And if you need to update the record holder email address, reach out to us and we can update that record holder email address. Claim that record on one stop uh, and that'll allow you to get access. And again, there's a video that explains how to do that and you can kind of see it. You know, it's one thing if you learn like me, sometimes it's better to see it in action than it is just to read something. Uh, so you can see that video and, and kind of watch in action how the account's created and how to claim the record. And once you've claimed a record, you're able to view your organization's profile and file annual registrations and update the organization's contact information. And again, user guides, video about the record claiming process right there on that link, which is the main charity page of our website. I use the professional solicitor, fundraising council and public safety solicitor registration user guide on the charity homepage to learn how to navigate and use the system if you're a professional solicitor fundraising council uh, and public safety solicitor. Last page on a one stop, just a few basic tips for the for the paid fundraisers. Uh, you can authorize additional individuals. It's this this particular point also applies to charities to have access to the organization's records on one stop. So after you've claim the record and you have your entity set up, entity account set up in one stop, you can actually authorize more than just yourself to go access that record and use that record or file in that record. And that's a, it's a handy tool to have and it's one that you want to use to your advantage. Uh, if you, you know, people come and go, board members come and go, uh, or directors come and go. Um, so having more than one person enables you to seamlessly move and file annually without interruption and also receive the notification. So even if you're not the person that does it, you get the notice and you can find the person that's supposed to do it. Uh, so the form is built also to ask for what's required based on your answers to each question. And the form online is going to update itself based on your answers to the questions on the form. And if you've confirmed that you've been registered in other states, so in talking about solicitors here, it's gonna ask you to specify those states. If you're a solicitor or counseling, you have contracts with those with charities, it's gonna ask you to attach them. Uh, filing online, you can attach, add contracts at any time. So if you're a registered fundraising counsel, go into your profile and you select the option to add a contract and you can add a new contract that you may have entered into with a charity into the system, into the online system uh, at any point in time. Same with solicitors as well. For solicitors, if you've entered into a fundraising notice and contract, um, you can go into the online system, file that fundraising notice, attach your contract as part of that filing, and it'll prompt you uh, when you file your annual registrations in the online system to then file the interim accounting reports required for each of those contracts if you're a professional solicitor. For name changes, you'll still need to submit those uh, name changing documents via email to us offline. So the email DL charity underscore SOS at Maryland.gov. That email address is going to come up again at the end. Uh, so don't worry if you missed it. And again, this will be recorded. So that email pops up a few times here early and then later on. Uh, but DL charity underscore SOS at Maryland.gov for email questions. And if you're submitting annual registrations for multiple years, uh, you will submit a separate registration for each year. 
uh, when you bring up your annual registration form in the system, one of the first items on that page at the top is a due date. Pay attention to that due date. And this applies if there's charity uh, folks sitting on uh, this town hall as well. This same applies to your charitable registrations annually. Look at that due date at the top. If it seems outdated, it means our records indicate something is missing from a prior year. You're going to want to reach out to us. Um, and figure out why it is that we say you're not current, uh, especially if it's you know more than a year. Um, that means we're missing something and uh, you need to send us something from a prior filing. Or maybe you think you already sent it or maybe you did already send it. Uh, but either way, when something like that happens, when you see the outdated renewal date at the top, you're gonna wanna reach out to us and figure out why it is we don't think you're current. And that way we can get that settled up and then you can file on the online system and get everything uh, back to normal and back in compliance. So uh, on to the, the main uh, part of the show today, professional solicitors and fundraising council registrations, talking about the registration requirements of the folks that are, are paid to either help or to fundraise, help fundraise or fundraise on behalf of charitable organizations. So first thing here, fundraising council registration. What is a fundraising council? First of all, it's a person who is compensated for advising a charity about a solicitation in Maryland or holding, planning, or managing a solicitation in Maryland. The fundraising council is prohibited from directly soliciting or receiving charitable contributions. Fundraising council must register annually. So before a fundraising council uh, starts uh, engaging in council activities in Maryland, it should register. Uh, we're within 10 days of signing its contract, should register. And then it's gonna file annually thereafter, a year from the date it first filed if you're a fundraising council. So again, these are folks that are advising, helping hold, plan, or manage, but they're not directly soliciting on behalf of the charity. So, uh, you know, think about target marketing and advising on how to solicit or who to solicit or how to word stuff, but not actually making the ask for the contribution. Application to register as a fundraising council. Fundraising councils are required to register prior to providing services to a charitable organization. <clears throat> Registration includes submission of an application to register as a fundraising council. There's a $250 registration fee payable to the Secretary of State. And uh, the fundraising council needs to submit copies of all current fundraising agreements that it has uh, for those that it's going to counsel uh, for soliciting in Maryland. The fundraising council does not have current fundraising contracts. A sample contract should be submitted with the application to register. Fundraising council must also submit the names of each current officer and employee the names of new officers and employees must be submitted within 10 days after that new officer employee begins work for the fundraising council. Fundraising councils, fundraising agreements. So a fundraising agreement, uh, otherwise oftentimes referred to as a contract. So a contract between a fundraising council and a charitable organization. A fundraising council is required to submit a copy of each fundraising agreement by the 10th day after the agreement is made or the start of the charitable solicitation, whichever is earlier. All agreements between fundraising council and charitable organizations shall include the names and addresses of the parties, the services to be provided, the number of persons to be involved in providing the services and the times when those services are to be provided and also the method and formula for compensation a fundraising council is prohibited though from receiving compensation based upon the percentage of contributions received as a result of the services provided. So fundraising councils, you're not gonna see contracts that stipulate X percent of contributions received uh, is, is what gets paid to the council that's, that's not allowed under the Solicitations Act. Professional solicitors. So what's the difference? A fundraising council we talked about, a professional solicitor is compensated for advising a charity about a charitable solicitation, holding, planning, or managing a solicitation. 
or soliciting or receiving contributions for a charitable organization. The solicitation or receipt of contributions is the distinction between the fundraising council that we just talked about and a professional solicitor that we're going to talk about now. So the professional solicitor is the one making the ask on behalf of the charity. Think about somebody making a phone call to you and asking for donations. Not always a professional solicitor, but a good chance it will be. That person making that phone call and getting paid by the charity to make the phone call to raise money for the charity, that person making the direct, direct ask on behalf of the charity is the professional solicitor. So counsel is really about advising, helping you hold, plan, or manage. The solicitor can do all that, but is also going to solicit or receive the contributions for the charitable organization as well. Application to register. Professional solicitors are required to register prior to soliciting in Maryland or receiving contributions from Maryland. And registration include, uh, includes submitting an application to register and a surety bond. Registration of the $350 fee is payable to the Secretary of State. And if applicable, accounting reports submit a sample fundraising agreement if the solicitor does not currently have any agreements. So you see that looks relatively similar to, um, to what a fundraising council is submitting. Uh, but there are some differences and we're gonna start to get into that here. Uh, professional solicitors uh, must also submit a surety bond. So bonded in the amount of 25,000 uh, running to the state of Maryland in lieu of a surety bond, the act authorizes the submission of a $25,000 irrevocable letter of credit. A solicitor must have either a surety bond or irrevocable letter of credit in force as long as their registration is in effect. So a professional solicitor has to be bonded in, 20, in the amount of $25,000 and that bond must remain in place for as long as that professional solicitor is registered in Maryland. An application to register must list the name of each current officer, agent, member, associate solicitor, and employee who works in fundraising. Names of new officers, agents, associate solicitors, and employees must be submitted within 10 days after the individual begins employment. So annually, a professional solicitor is going to register. Uh, and it's, again, it's a little more information for professional solicitors that'll be provided. So every year, still gonna give us an application, still gonna pay the $350 fee to register annually as a professional solicitor, still giving us the current list of names still going to have to give us new officers and employees within 10 days after employment begins every year. Uh, the thing that is a little different here with professional solicitors from fundraising councils is professional solicitors every year must submit an interim accounting report for every active fundraising agreement that they have. Any addendums to fundraising agreements that were not previously submitted should also be submitted annually. We're going to talk about accounting reports a little later on. Uh, but for every contract that is active that the professional solicitor has at the time of their annual registration, an interim accounting report should be submitted for that contract as part of the organization's annual registration. So certain common registration mistakes we see from solicitors really about timely submitting contracts, not submitting required attachments or addendums, uh, the other one we see is not providing the scripts or charitable or text of charitable solicitations with the copies of contracts provided. Uh, the Solicitations Act requires that the text the professional solicitor or associate solicitor uses in a charitable solicitation be attached to those fundraising agreements. So professional solicitors fundraising agreements. So a professional solicitor is required to submit a copy of each fundraising agreement by the 10th day after the agreement is made uh, or the start of the solicitation, whichever is earlier, the text used shall be attached to the agreement and shall include certain lines uh, that the Solicitations Act requires in the text of the charitable solicitation by a professional solicitor. Those items are the name of the charitable organization for which the charitable solicitation is made, the specific charitable purpose that is to be advanced with the charitable contributions, and a statement that the person who solicits charitable contributions is a paid fundraiser 
and on request, we'll provide a copy of the charitable organization's financial statement. So any script that a professional solicitor uses needs to have these items included in that script. Seems obvious, uh, but to raise the money for a charity and you're a professional solicitor, you need to say which charity you're raising money for. You need to explain the purpose that's to be advanced by those contributions. And a statement needs to be made that the professional solicitor is a, is a paid fundraiser and that on request, uh, they'll provide a copy of the organization's financial statement uh, to the prospective donor. A few more pieces here about fundraising agreements. An agreement between a professional solic uh, solicitor and a person engaged to receive or hold contributions resulting from the professional solicitor's fundraising agreement with a charity shall be attached to the fundraising agreements submitted to the Secretary of State. So if there's a person engaged to receive or hold contributions that are received as a result of a professional solicitor's work, that agreement should also be included. All agreements between professional solicitors and charitable organizations need to include the names and addresses of the parties. The minimum percentage of the gross receipts from charitable solicitations that will be used by the charitable organization exclusively to advance its charitable purposes and the text that the professional solicitor or associate solicitor will use in each charitable solicitation. So there is a submission of, that a professional solicitor has to make uh, called a fundraising notice, not to be confused with the exempt organization fundraising notice that charities file, different fundraising notice to be filed with professional solicitors. <clears throat> Before starting a public solicitation for a charitable organization, a professional solicitor must submit a fundraising notice for each fundraising campaign. This professional solicitor fundraising notice form requests information about the type of fundraising method to be used and the dates for each fundraising campaign. Uh, required to submit a copy of the fundraising agreement with the notice. So with this fundraising notice, you'll attach that contract and you'll submit copies of subcontracts or other contracts in furtherance of the agreement between the charity and professional solicitor. So maybe uh, a professional solicitor subcontracts to another fundraising company and they have an agreement to subcontract out that work, that subcontract would need to be included because it's in furtherance of the agreement between the charity and the professional solicitor and includes submission of caging agreements generally defined as an agreement between a solicitor or charity and a person engaged to receive or hold contributions resulting from an agreement between the charity and solicitor. So if somebody's uh, engaged to receive and hold those contributions, that agreement should also be included with the fundraising notice form that's filed by the professional solicitor. Professional solicitor accounting reports. So we talked uh, briefly about accounting reports there a few slides ago. Professional solicitors, must submit accounting reports, final and interim accounting reports. Reports account for the funds received and dispersed during certain periods of time of the fundraising campaign. The same accounting report form is used for both interim and final reports. And on the form, it's gonna ask the solicitor to indicate whether the accounting report is a final or an interim accounting report. Final accounting reports, uh, they're required within three months after the end of the fundraising campaign and must account for all funds received and dispersed during the entire fundraising campaign, however long that is. Could be one month, could be one year, could be five years. That final accounting report is accounting for the total received and dispersed uh, as a part of that professional solicitor's work on behalf of the charity. Professional solicitor and authorized representative of the charity must sign and certify the accounting reports. Interim accounting reports must be submitted with an application to register as a professional solicitor for each of the ongoing campaigns. The interim report accounts for all funds received and dispersed from the beginning of the campaign through a date within three months before the solicitor's current registration expires. So in layman's terms, what does that really mean? As we talked about earlier, professional solicitors, you register initially, and then you register annually thereafter. 
So when you have to file your annual registrations, you're going to file interim accounting reports for all your active contracts. And those interim accounting reports should include all the funds received and dispersed from the beginning of the campaign up to at, uh, at least three months before that registration expiration date. So if your registration is going to expire today, your accounting report should be current as of three months before today. So anytime between then and now would be an acceptable date range on the accounting report, the interim accounting report that's being filed. Interim accounting reports must be signed and certified by the solicitor and an authorized representative of the charity as well. So again, accounting reports, both the charity and solicitor need to sign off on it. And final accounting reports include everything from beginning to end that the campaign brought in, expenses uh, you know, received and disbursements made as a result of that fundraising effort. And then interim accounting reports, you're filing as part of your annual registration with the Secretary of State's office as a professional solicitor. And the numbers must be uh, accurate within three months of the due date of your professional solicitor filing. Charitable solicitation records for a professional solicitor for each fundraising drive event campaign, professional solicitor shall keep certain records. Uh, those records include all compensation received for services rendered and expenses incurred, the names and address of each associate solicitor, the amount of compensation paid to each associate solicitor, and the dates when payments were made, the name and address and telephone number of each person solicited who made a pledge or charitable contribution, the date of each charitable solicitation, each amount pledged or contributed, and if a refund was requested, the date the refund was made. These records shall be kept for at least three years after the end of the fundraising drive campaign or event. So the, the solicitor needs to keep these records for three years beyond the time that fundraising event ends. Public safety solicitors, so uh, we talked about Fundraising councils, we've talked about professional solicitors. Now we're gonna to touch on public safety solicitors. What is a public safety solicitor? Uh, it's uh, those, those companies that are raising money on behalf of a public safety organization. Uh, those public safety solicitors are required to register and disclose certain information. A public safety solicitor is a person who for pay, solicits or receives public safety contributions personally or through another. So in other words, what's a public safety contribution? Think about your local, uh, easiest example to provide is your local volunteer fire company. They're raising money. The Solicitations Act goes about carving out this thing called public safety contribution. And that's a contribution that is made on behalf of a public safety organization. Good example of that's your local fire department that organization receives a contribution. The Solicitations Act considers it a public safety contribution if it's going to be used for the purposes of, in this example, the fire department, right? Maintenance equipment, firehouse, trucks, training, things of that nature to make that volunteer fire company run. It's a good example of what that is. Uh, so a, a paid solicitor, a professional solicitor for that public safety organization is defined as a public safety solicitor. Their application to register includes uh, the application itself, the form itself, surety bond in the amount of $25,000. Uh, same thing applies here uh, as to a professional solicitor uh, run to the state of Maryland. They can also have a $25,000 irrevocable letter of credit. So either way, uh, $25,000, normally we're seeing the surety bond. Uh, copy of the fundraising agreements with public safety organization, application fee of $100 for each application. The interesting thing of note here for public safety solicitors is that a public safety solicitor must submit a separate application for each public safety organization with which it has a fundraising agreement. So basically for a public safety solicitor, it's $100 in an application for every contract. 
that it has with a public safety organization. The $25,000 bond could be applied to all. You don't need a separate bond for each one. But a separate application and $100 fee and con for every contract you have with the public safety organization. This differs from professional solicitors and fundraising councils who will file once annually, pay their registration fee, and submit one application for however many contracts they have with charitable organizations. Public safety solicitor with the current registration is not required to execute and submit an additional surety bond or irrevocable letter of credit for each public safety organization, provided the separate application is submitted for each organization. So uh, each registration expires on the first anniversary of its approval date. So a year from the day it's filed is when that application's registration expires. So public safety solicitors, a different subset of professional solicitor with different requirements for different types of organizations that they'd be soliciting on behalf of. Public safety solicitations, the public safety solicitor shall include in all written solicitations and receipts for public safety contributions, a toll-free number of the public safety solicitor within the area code in which the public safety contribution is solicited so that individuals or businesses solicited can obtain verification of authenticity or make any complaints they may have about the public safety solicitation received. And a statement that for cost of copies and postage, the information submitted under the Maryland Solicitations Act is available from the Secretary of State and the address and telephone number of the Secretary of State. A public safety solicitor may not solicit public safety contributions unless the script of an oral solicitation and copy of a written solicitation is approved by the public safety organization on whose behalf the public safety contribution is solicited and includes the specific purpose that is to be advanced with public safety contributions and a statement that the person is soliciting on behalf of a public safety organization. So public safety solicitor can't go out there and raise money on behalf of a public safety organization without these things being in place. The script has to be approved by the public safety organization. The specific purpose that is to be advanced with the public safety contributions needs to be included in that script. And in that script, uh, there needs to be something that explains the person is soliciting on behalf of a public safety organization. And that's key there. Somebody cannot misrepresent that they are a policeman or firefighter uh, when soliciting contributions on behalf of somebody if they're not a policeman or firefighter. A copy of the approved script of an oral solicitation and a copy of a written solicitation shall be made available to the Secretary of State upon request. So some informational resources here uh, for charitable organizations uh, or their councils or solicitors. Uh, just some good information here for nonprofits in general to have and the nonprofit world to have. A community law center, Maryland nonprofits, Maryland Nonprofit Development Center, local bar associations are all good places for charitable organizations to go to find information and resources. Um, especially if they don't have their own legal counsel. These are very good uh, places to go visit uh, to find some resources and help uh, for charitable organizations.